I'm Sawyer, and you're listening to Our House A to Z. All right, so we're between trips. Between we, trips. We just got back from our little jaunt down to PA for that conference. Little ministry, yeah. little ministry trip, and it was yeah. great. It we was had a great, great time. It was beautiful. Big shout out um, to the Marshalls. Zach did. I mean, we had recorded the podcast before we left, and we talked about how I don't like all the loud music, and so Zach did not play music on the car ride. So there was that. That's true. You actually ended up playing it. At the end, like our last like two hours on the way home. We right. listened to music. We talked a lot, but we somehow we lot. didn't like hit all. We should have made lists of podcast ideas, but we were off the clock. We, we <laughs> definitely were. We definitely were. But it was so nice. It and, was uh, nice. Big shout out to uh, State Auto for hey. setting us up with a really fun rental car. Yeah, so it was very fun. That was a lot of fun. It's like we were having a midlife crisis, but here we are. It was. It felt a little bit like midlife crisis material. I told him that it was just in time. Do you for that feel like midlife crisis. do you feel like you're at the stage of life for a midlife crisis? What what is the stage? I don't, again? I think it's 40s somewhere in your like mid 40s probably. So okay. you might be just a little before that. Ooh, it's mid 40s. Yeah. I don't know. That's just my guess. Is it 40s, 50s? I don't know. I don't know. What exactly is a midlife crisis? Can you define it? I think it's just like at a place in your life where you're kind of looking forward and looking back and feeling like, "Oh wow, is it possible that the best days are behind me?" Now, remember they used to have like the over the hill? Remember 40 was like over the hill and it was... Oh, I thought it was older than that. No, yeah, it was, was like the over the hill birthday was your 40th birthday and people used to go all out for the 40th because that was like, I remember being a kid and my parents turned 40 and being like, oh my gosh, like yeah. being devastated. My parents are old. Yeah. And I think our kids are going to feel the same way when we hit 40. But anyway, yeah. midlife crisis. Now it's like ageist to say somebody's old. <laughs> It's like ages to say that any certain number is over the hill. It's it's all relative to that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So midlife crisis. Yeah. And I think you just kind of try to come up with ways or like you're trying to savor or hold on to your youngness, whatever's left of it. And so I think that looks different for everybody. I, I think you look young, babe. Yeah. I still think I think you look young. I feel like you just had your hair done and you're getting some sun from being outside. But those are all awesome. midlife crisis things. Now all of a sudden you have to get your hair done more often. And really? Yeah. I feel like girls you have to buy always... more expensive skincare because you're like, oh my gosh, I need the, all the stuff with uh, the extra wrinkles. wrinkle yeah, care sure. and young skin, younger, firmer looking skin. That's the line. Younger, firmer looking skin. Interesting. And Okay. Good to know. There's one. It's called Bum Bum Cream. Bum, 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 bum. Okay. And it's Tell supposed to be it. skin tightening. Fortunately, I learned about it from Messer, who's 11 and doesn't need any skin tightening anywhere. But she has it. Probably shouldn't be using it. But here we are. Is and it to tighten up your butt? It's supposed to be. For but your, you can use it anywhere. You could, you could use it on any loose spaces. I feel like I feel like by the time <laughs> any loose skin. By the time your bum bum is loose, cream is not going <laughs> to fix it. That's <laughs> not even the bum bum cream. Not even the bum bum cream. But so anyway, well, it's hmm. interesting. So there's that. I don't know. I feel like for me, the stage of life I'm in right now, the confusing thing is I don't know whether to put on in the morning like a polo, khakis and boat shoes. Yeah. Or like a pack sun t-shirt and right. ripped rip jeans. I feel like I'm there too. Is that just bands. style or are we at like this weird breaking point age wise where we don't know how to dress? Yeah. I mean, every Easter too, it's like, you're, what does what Easter clothes look like? The dress up thing. Like I what know. is a suit? Because we don't, I don't wear suits every day. And so then you're like, suits go out of trend too. They mm -hmm. go out of style, like cuts and yeah. fits and all that kind of thing. Just like every pant style and shirt style and jewelry and yeah. all of that. And so then it's like, even the stuff that I think is like more trendy is like already not but it's like then you're trying to do it and it's almost worse that that's why guys go to the khakis and polos every day because yeah. the kind of jeans that you wear and the kind of t-shirts that you wear it's like already not cool interesting yeah it is interesting because then I'm, it's a whole vibe then you have to have your sneakers like the right shoe that matches that with that style with pant outfit. too absolutely but I think that's the confusing part the place I live in right now is like who am I in the morning it's like a bipolar thing like am I <laughs> young today uh, am I old today that's the hard part about being over the hills like you're still at the top of the hill and you could fall down to either side you're not over the hill yet, though. You're about to approach the peak. But you said 40th birthday is over the hill. I turned 40 in a few months. I know, but that's what I just said. You're not over the hill yet. Oh, okay. Over the hill is once you hit 40. So you're having this crisis now ahead of time. Yeah, but I don't really feel a crisis. Like, I honestly don't have any urge to go out and buy a sports car, so... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know. I that, mean, why buy sports cars when you can buy tractors? Now that I could do, yeah. I mean, I already have that. I already have everything, so I don't really. You said the other day, actually last night, you said you feel like the Lord is answering every one of your prayers, not everyone, all your prayers this season. It does. Yeah, it feels like, like that. Do you feel like your new lawnmower is one of those prayers? I think it's just the idea of it. It's not, I wasn't ever praying for that specific lawnmower, but I've had a list of frustrations and I feel like. The lawnmower was always one of the them. The lawnmower was always a frustration. And now, I feel like lawn mowing is always a couple's argument. Okay. Like, I feel like we have found the lawn to be like one of those like hot topics where it's like not cut off enough or it's not cut like well enough or the wife wants to do it or the husband wants to do it. And it yeah. seems like one of those like funny things. The I, lawn. I get it. But I don't feel like we fight over the lawn. No, but when we were first. We, we both want the lawn to look nice. But there were years in earlier in our marriage where I felt like you did not cut the lawn often enough. Yeah. And I remember being like so frustrated because I felt like why the lawn I, is so I long. Not, why did I not cut it? I don't remember. Huh. I mean, part of it, you've always complained about the lawnmower. We've always had a, a hand-me-down lawnmower. Usually like third or fourth hand lawnmowers. Yeah. I've never bought a lawnmower. I know. Until now. I know. But I will admit like it was frustrating. Like there were times, you know. You'd the, be like, that lawnmower, the blades, the thing, the, the this, the, lawnmower, the, the that, the power steering. It doesn't have power steering. I never the, complained about the blades. The I t- bagger I, I doesn't the work. Blade, it's clogged. I took the blades off and sharpened them every year. But I would get tennis elbow trying to turn that oh lawnmower gosh. steering wheel. <laughs> and there were two summers where I could only make right turns and not yeah. left. So I had to mow the whole lawn with a series of right turns so that was interesting right i'm not gonna brag on big our, big circle all the way into lines. the middle <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> something like that uh it's good so yes i bought a i bought a lawnmower and the lawnmower we had for a while the blades were so even if you sharpened them they were it was like uneven it was uneven so the lawn always had like it was always higher on on like one side and, of the, of the, the strip, mow yes. the stripe. every strip had like just it, true. it was it yeah. was tough it was that's true first world problems but living it up just yeah. just enough to like keep you humble. I feel like if I wasn't mowing the lawn, I was working on some other project that was just more important in my head. But the older you get, the more you care about the lawn too. That's true. You know, the older you get, you're like, I should set up some sprinklers and seed over here and the other thing. And when you're young, you're just like dropping stuff on the grass and you're just like, ah. You have people parking okay on your lawn. Kills the grass, whatever. Not the parking on the lawn. It's the worst. Although, you know what's cracking me up? Talking to Holly about Roger mowing the lawn and Holly started mowing it. And mm-hmm. she was saying how this is so funny. She was saying how like it's the best kept secret. It's the best it's like kept the secret man that secret. guys have because we're all like, oh, I guess I'll go out and mow the lawn. But then you like put your AirPods in and you just like spend time driving around in the sunshine. In the sunshine, and... yeah, it's beautiful outside. <laughs> and so it's so funny because like when she was two when hours she was, listening to a podcast, when and... she was pregnant, she couldn't drive a car, and she was like, I she took all out all her aggression on the lawn. <laughs> I love that. Uh, She's so funny. Oh, my God. That is funny. So what other prayers do you feel like the Lord's answering this season? Oh, let me name the ways. Besides your lawnmower. Well, I feel like we've been living in a little bit of a wilderness area for the church yeah. for a long time. And the room feels a little bit more like... Something like... Yeah, like we've crossed a threshold. Mm-hmm. Now, again, it's like 48 hours ago. We're talking about pulling the next building permit. Yeah. I know, but um, what I find interesting about that is that you look at this solid space of a sanctuary now and you're so grateful for that. And there's something in you that is satisfied by stability and like something permanent something permanent yeah but you always like changing things too yeah like i build everything on wheels or adaptable which is also always irritates me yeah i know but i do think that still the change within the stable is where i thrive i think Mm. you know you have some things that are permanent and then within that there's like a lot of flexibility yeah which I think a lot of times people gravitate towards permanent things because subconsciously they're unstable. Right. But I feel like very stable on the foundationally. And so then I, on top of that, I want everything to be collapsible, movable, portable, oh, foldable, geez. viable, sellable. But everybody's different. I feel like that was a huge thing to cross that threshold. I feel like with the kids too, mm-hmm. you know, just... We went to bed last night with Sawyer playing the piano right beneath our <laughs> master bedroom. I don't think you can say primary. master bedroom anymore. Yeah, primary bedroom. Or just our room. Yeah. I don't know. Something still sounds good. I like the ring of it, the master bedroom. But anyway, so right below that is the piano room and Sawyer's in it banging away on uh, he's in the room. Mm-hmm. It's not he's in the room. Oh, 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 oh. He's in the room. Yeah, 
he's t- he's filling that down there and i'm like thank you lord thank you lord because i remember playing myself to sleep at night like playing the piano like all night long you played yourself to sleep at night well, while no, you were playing I the piano i think i played the rest of the family to sleep <laughs> probably <laughs> sure. uh, but uh yeah he was playing i was like thank you god because i've been praying for the boys to mm-hmm. be, get into some music so and now what do you think if house. you if you look back at like that season of life or the boys are almost 13 and 14 do you remember that age very well I the do. 13 14 i do what do you remember as like monumental like i know you have like your camp experience but what like outside of that you remember about it well, when I was 14, I that band that I played with came to our church for the very first time. So that was kind of like a shift in music for me because I was just playing in church. Mm-hmm. But I was playing in church every Sunday. And then church was just big. We Everything was church. Everything revolved around church. Mm-hmm. Even as a middle schooler, it was like the trips we took were church trips, you know, like with the youth group right. down to Brownsville or to Charlotte to a conference or to a concert. A but now you were in public school at that time, Carmen right? Carmen concert. Remember Carmen? Yeah, I went to yeah. a Carmen concert too. I saw the Addicted to Jesus, the A2J tour. Addicted to Jesus. Saw that. I think we saw Riot too. I saw the Riot tour. We want a riot. I was in public school since third grade, fourth grade, fourth grade. I was in private up till then. But never any like extracurricular with school or whatever, like when you were in middle school or anything? No. Just like even band, nothing? Yeah, but I wasn't in marching band. That's when they traveled and did the thing. I was in concert band. Okay. I pole vaulted for like five minutes with the track team. So here's something. Talking about meet. age, you're going to be 40 this year. What are your thoughts on turning 40? How do you feel about it? Oh, I have mixed feelings, I guess. How do you feel about it? Are you like 40? fine That's with more it? That's important. Like so you're usually fine with stuff. Well, I can't really stop it. You know, it's going to happen. It's you can't. Come. Are you hopeful about anything? Like when you look forward to the next 10 years or? Well, people talk about decades, right? And like you have people who like their 40s were like the greatest decade of their life. Mm-hmm. You know, I think what I'm looking forward to is production. I'm looking forward to fruitfulness. Mm-hmm. I feel like we've been building for a while and I'm wondering what it's going to look like to shift gears into like. Like not not building, but. Yeah, I don't know. I know things will shift for us, but. Yeah. I've been trying to envision how that's going to look. But yeah, no, I'm, I feel hopeful about it. Yeah. How do you feel? About you turning 40? It's going to be weird to have a 40-year-old husband. Yes. 40 sounds so old. I know. And you... I know it doesn't. Like, I have friends that are 40s and 50s, and it doesn't seem old to me. No. But there's something about me personally. You're like, oh, that's so strange. Like, here I, I am. But I am looking forward to, I hear a lot of people say it's like you care less and less about what people think the older you get. Well, I don't, I think that ship sailed for me. For you, I know. I mean, I don't know how it could get any worse, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but for me personally. Any worse or any better? I'm yeah. like, that's so interesting because there's a lot of parts of me that like are fine with whatever people think. But then there's some, like we've talked about it before, I'm always so nervous to like hurt people's feelings. And I just want to like go around just confident in the fact that I'm just hurting people's feelings and it's just part of life. Well, you did say something to me earlier today that really stuck. You said oh. that I'm less nice now than I've ever been. Nope. I didn't say that. Uh, Accommodating, I said. mm, I think you used some other words too, but okay. So we'll go with accommodating. What do you mean by that? And I'm wondering if that's connected to my age. That you're less accommodating? Yeah. Explain that so our listeners really know what I'm dealing with. I don't think they need to know. (laughs) I don't think they need to know what I'm dealing with is a better way to put it. What is that? Um, What are you dealing with? Sounds Yeah, terrible. I guess nice is. I feel like you used to be nicer. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. So maybe that is the word. Like sometimes we'll be in, and everybody who's actual real friends of Zach and people that you're close with hmm. already know this about you. Like that you have this thing when you're like done, you're done. Oh, yeah. And I think there used to be part of you that had at least the sensitivity or empathy to like be like, oh, I wonder what somebody else thinks. Like it might be hurtful if I just like walk away while they're in the middle of talking. And now you're just like, you don't really care. It'll just be like they're talking and you've moved on and you're like looking all around the room. You're like, we'll pull your phone out and start like doing stuff on your phone while people are talking to you. And then you're just like, got to go. And you walk away. Hmm. And it's very interesting. I, I think, I think so. that part has gotten worse, unfortunately. <laughs> and so well, I wish I'm there was a way to just 40. prep you're, people you just better. When I you're know. 40, you just don't care as much. I know. Is that true? I, I don't think that's true. I know people that are way past 40 and they're like incredibly considerate. They're like incredibly conscious and considerate. I think you can be conscious about other people and still like be confident in who you are. Mm. But yeah, I think that's like one of the things that is challenging, you know, because a lot of times I feel like the burden to like pick up the... I don't want to say slack there, but like pick up the like, hey, no, pick I'm here pieces. and I care. Like, pick up the pieces okay. of all my broken I know you're just really hoping that like Zach would be the one caring, but 
I care. And Well, that's like that person from the Instagram we were looking at yesterday. They're like, that pastor used to look after me, and now I just get his wife. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> there is this really funny Instagram account, and it's called Do Better Church. I know it's supposed to be really serious. I know it, and I know— Wait, th- this is exactly what you're talking about. I don't care. And you are like, I know it's supposed to be this. And it's like actually really serious. And I'm like, there's not an ounce of my soul that could take it seriously. I know because I I still am at a place where it's like, okay, so last week we talked about some stuff with Mark Driscoll and James River Church. And I feel like we were really courteous to both sides of that argument, like both sides of like, hey, we can see both sides of this. And like, yeah, you know, like here are some ways. I will admit I did not have all the information when we talked about I said that, too. We both said that. Yeah, we both said that. Both were very clear about that. And we were very clear that we love Mark Driscoll. But I mean, no matter what, it was like haters going to hate. I mean, it's like, I can't believe you would like disrespect and dishonor Mark Driscoll. I'm like, what in the world? I don't know anybody said that. Yeah. Like a response, like one of the, like the YouTube responses and somebody else. I'm like, did you listen to the podcast? Did did I miss something? I I, I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm actually, I err usually on the Mark Driscoll side. I, I know. But that's why it was so funny that somebody was like all up in arms about yeah. The Mark Triscoll, whatever. Anyway. People are looking for it. You're looking for it. Yeah. You send out the raven. Okay. You know, so that's, I think I'm not over those things. Like I'm not over the things that I want to like explain myself still to be like, no, like that's not what I meant. Like, I'm so sorry you heard that. That was like not at all what was like intended. I don't know. Those things are hard. So like that stuff is less, I, sometimes I think is less bothersome too, but then sometimes you get emails that are like hate emails and you're all flustered by them. Very rarely. But I think not all flustered. I think I, I like want to respond and you don't want me to respond. I think yeah. that's the, I think I want to respond um, because sometimes it feels like the more responsible thing is to not ignore your accusers. Sometimes you're supposed to, and sometimes it's good for you to have to like write this email and then delete the whole thing and rewrite it because you're not writing it in patience or in love. And then, yeah. and then go back and edit again and then be like, uh, I should probably not add this part. You know, it's been, it's been good. It's been an exercise in humility for me <laughs> to respond to, you know, my haters. But Regardless, yes. So back 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 to to the the Instagram. Instagram. Okay, so there's this Instagram account that's called Do Better Church. And it's kind of like anybody who writes in a bad church experience, they post it, they post the pastor's name, and they post the church. And they just like post the write-up of whatever somebody is upset about and complained about where they were let down by a church. Right. There's part of me that wants to say, you always want to give people the benefit of the doubt. I want to be given the benefit of the doubt. So I understand that there are a lot of us that all want the church as a whole to do better. Hmm. You know, we've seen like a lot of brokenness in leadership and authority and brokenness in ministry and brokenness in hearts and people operating from wounds and all this stuff. Like we've seen all that and we know that's there. I think it's really hard when there's always pointed at church leadership. And obviously, am I going to be biased? Yeah. When you're a church leader, it's like you take it more personal, of course. But I want to like point fingers around the entire church and say like, do better church, oh, the bride of Christ, wait, like oh, do better bride of Christ, so not like the, the church entity. Is not just the leadership. You're saying the church yes. is not just the pastors. I am, but I feel like all of mm. everything that gets posted in that specific Instagram That's is more about how innovative the church leadership. It's like the entity of the structure of a church and how it's run. And again, I am not defending bad leadership. No. And like sin in leadership and all of that stuff. Definitely not. That's not the case. It's just, I don't know how fruitful it is. And I know that people would argue that they don't think stuff we do is fruitful. And I get that. Yeah. It's the Uh, finger pointing that is like hard for me. Can I just, I'm going to make this bold, radical statement and say, there's always been sin in leadership. Mm Mm-hmm. There's always been character flaws. There's always been abusers of power. Well, there's always been sin in people. There's, well, yeah. That's the so, thing. So, so the point, though, is like leadership's always been bad. However, when there is scandal or when there is spiritual abuse or when there is abuse of power or when there is whatever you want to say it. From the hugest, craziest thing all the way down to somebody didn't compliment my outfit when I showed up at church on Sunday or whatever. There's always been that, but never before have we seen this unprecedented like mass casualty thing. 
Yeah. Where it's like we share in each other's victimship at a rate that is so gross and toxic instead of challenging each other to say, well, what's the Lord trying to show you through this? Right. It's we immediately respond by, okay, let's all be victims of that too and wallow in that. And I I just, I cannot see the fruit of that anywhere. Even if the sin of the leader is egregious. This isn't really about them. They are going to be held accountable for their sins, not on Instagram, right. not on YouTube, not on... And most likely not by you. Definitely not by you. Right. But you are not responsible for that person. You're responsible for yeah. yourself. And that doesn't like validate how you've actually been hurt. Like It doesn't change the fact that you really are hurt a lot of times by... People in church, church family, people that you were really close to, people you saw as something, people you saw as had as leaders or, I mean, I was in a church for 26 years before we went through a lot of hurt. There's nothing in me that's like, what I want to do is like write all the sins of- How much did you post on Facebook about it? No, nothing. How much did you share on social media? Nothing. And I can't even like comprehend that. And I- And so I get like frustrated with accounts like that because I feel like- That was back when she did have Facebook, by the way. I feel like it's like the attacking of like the bride itself. And I I just don't see how that's fruitful for the bride of Christ. Again, an account maybe where you're like, hey, this stuff is really happening in church. There's an awareness thing. I get it. I get the awareness thing. I just feel like, and then to list every church name and pastor, I'm just, I can't get on board with it. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think you've got to be operating on another level to be able to honor someone who's like wounded you. But isn't that what as believers we're supposed to be calling each other up to is this place of like honoring people. And what I want to say is you going on social media for the purpose of dishonoring a spiritual leader says nothing about their honor. It says everything about yours. Right. Usually we talk about that in the positive. Like when you honor someone You don't honor them because they're honorable. You honor them because you're honorable. Like honor says more about the person who's doing the honoring Mm -hmm. than it does about the person who it's applied to. Mm -hmm. But the negative of that is so true. Like the dishonor piece is so true. Like when I hear people like somebody's going off on some church that whatever, they didn't get what they wanted there or whatever. It's like to me, all that is saying is what kind of person you are. Yeah. When you're posting this publicly and you need the world to know like how upset and offended you are, that just speaks to your brokenness. It speaks to your dishonor. Mm. Um, Because honestly, like part of this is, you know, you just said, babe, that we're church leaders. So you know, you see a different side of it. Yeah, exactly. But but it's also hard for people to receive from, I think, sometimes because maybe, but maybe it is. But it, it shouldn't really matter who says it. What matters is, is it true or not? And I think that in this case, it's like. And I'll close this thought with this. It makes me think that church might really be operating in something powerful. And that's why the enemy is kicking all this stuff up and your flesh is kicking all this stuff up because somebody said accountability is not church hurt or mm-hmm. whatever. Or accountability is not church abuse or yeah. whatever it is, power, yeah. spiritual abuse. It's like, no, what's likely happening is that church that offended you, it was doing what it was supposed to be doing and it was your flesh that got offended. Yeah, It's, it's just a different way to look at it. And unfortunately... The vast majority of the world probably jumps on the drama of it and the Netflix series documentary of it, too. But at the end of the day, we have to stand before the Lord and answer for it. I know. It's just the irony of an Instagram account that says, do better church while you're shooting arrows at the church is really hard. (laughs) Yeah. When when you're a part of the church. (laughs) Yeah. It's just hard. It it's is. just hard. Anyway. Anyway, all that to say. All that. That's that. How do we get off the, our 40s? How do we get? Oh, probably because subconsciously you are in denial that I'm turning 40. Getting ready to turn 40. Yeah. But anyway, no, I don't know. Uh, oh, my answered prayers. Our house was a big answered prayer for me. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I just like, I love it. And I feel like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Just a good now, season. Now, what would you tell people? Because I feel like. Going through like a hard season, you can struggle. Like the house thing, you were really stressed out about. How do you like walk through those seasons? Looking back, what could you have done better? Like if you look back on your last six months of life, what would you look at and say like, man, I wish I didn't do that. Or I wish I could have handled that situation better. Or where did I mishandle a situation? I don't know. It probably always boils down to like trusting the Lord and having peace. (laughs) 
probably I probably could always do that better. I don't know. I mean, we have friends of ours, close, close friends of ours who are going through, they're still in the middle of a house thing, mm-hmm. you know, just trying to find one and figure it out and lock in all mm-hmm. the finance pieces and everything Garbage, else. Yeah. And I look at it and I'm like, man, some of these people are doing this way better than me. Yeah. You know, the trusting God. I think the more capable we are, the harder that is, you know? It's like they say, you know, miracles happen more in third world countries because people are more desperate. I think the miracles that we see and hear about now are not because God loves that person more or because they're more holy. I think it's because they're more desperate. I think people are just more able to trust the Lord and really rely on him. Yeah. You know, the whole, like, you should have faith like a child, have faith Mm -hmm. like a child, have faith like a child. You know, at some point, the the real faith of a child is knowing that their parent can do it better than them. So it doesn't mean they don't still try, but they do it with their heart knowing that at the end of the day, they're taken care of. Right. So I think that would bring a measure of peace that Mm -hmm. I probably did not have remarkably. Well, it's so interesting because it's always the things that's out of our control. Yeah. And that's so hard. And it's easy when we feel like everything's going really well and it's in our control, like We have things under control that it's like, I just trust the Lord. He's so good. He's so faithful and all of that. It's like all the things you know, but you're like, and everything's going great. And as soon as something's not, we still are saying like, well, I trust the Lord. But our like response internally is really frustrated and lack of peace and all of that. And so is it saying that you don't trust the Lord? Maybe I feel like the response says you don't trust the Lord, especially when you're trying to get into control the things that you feel like are not in your control. I want to trust him. I want it really (laughs) bad. But at the end of the day, striving is a choice. Right. And I think that's terrifying because we want to think like, oh, I just sort of defaulted into striving because this thing wasn't working and I know I need to trust God, but I'm striving. It's like, well, you're choosing Mm -hmm. to trust in yourself. Yeah. And I think, again, the more capable we are, which I feel like you and I were like capable people. I feel like we get a lot of things done. We like to see a lot of things happen. And so we probably have a higher propensity of knowing that, okay, what are my abilities able to do here? Instead of how quick can I get past my abilities and move on to God's? Yeah. You know, I don't know, but that's definitely an area for those folks out there who, you know, you're high capacity people and you achieve great exploits, you know, for the kingdom and for whatever else. It's like, man, we really need to make sure that because no matter where that line is, God can do greater. I so know. I think he can do. But he uses us too. He's still using like, you know, when he gives certain talents to the, the talents, the parable of the talents, it's like there's still an expectation there that you're going to use what you've been given yeah. to the fullest ability. Yeah. Well, in that line, the two guys who went and got it right, we always focus on the guy who ends up being thrown into the fire mm-hmm. with the weeping and gnashing of teeth or whatever. It's, it's pretty sa- savage. But All for hiding your talents. Yeah, yeah. Don't do it. <laughs> well, that's that's the best like fear factor for your kids, you know? Oh my gosh. Um, but I no, I think you've got to pay attention that one guy gets five and one guy gets four. And then the other one, the, the guy who was given cities, you mm-hmm. know, the other thing, it's like, Okay, so even the guys who did it right got different amounts and achieved different things corresponding to those amounts. So what I have to think is like if you were given one thing and let's just say I don't even think anybody's ever given one thing. I think sometimes people are only aware of the one thing. Okay, so at this season of your life, you 27 year old bachelorette or something, you have one thing. You don't. You have more. But the one thing that you're aware of and you're right. like, well, I only have that this one like thing. That you like focus on. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like one you thing. only have this one thing. Okay. Like, I'm good at and I'm confident. Right. In. And But so the Lord might not expect you to turn it into seven things. He might expect you to turn it into two. Right. And you with two things, the Lord is saying, hey, I know you don't have as much as the person across the aisle from you or the person in your greenhouse mm-hmm. who's sharing the testimony or whatever. We're always thinking about that. But the guy with four things, instead of being concerned that the guy with five things was given five and he was Mm -hmm. only given four, he went out and doubled them. And he didn't know that the guy with five was going to double his two. But it's like, I feel that way about across the board, be way less concerned with how many you have and be way more concerned with how many you can make out of them. Right. Yeah. How do we get there? I don't know. But here we are. And I think we should save this for next week's conversation because I think there's a deeper conversation in here. And are you thinking like a part one, part two? Well, no. This is just kind of like I know a teaser do. for next week. We should do a choose your own ending podcast. Choose your own Who's choosing the ending? The listener. How? I don't know. 
Ben Ben can figure it out. Like saying, would you rather talk about this or this? No, I'm saying like, would you rather this conversation go this direction? <laughs> would you rather them? I don't know. It'd I'm, be cool. It's very cool. But we have a weird church. We have a weird listenership. I don't oh know. my people, gosh! People, who knows what people would do? Who anyway, knows what people? Do? Anyway, well, you oh, get I, to find out. Okay. Okay. See fine. you next week. We'll see you next week. This is Messer, and I'm Willa. This is our house from A to Z. Thanks for coming over. <laughs> Am I in danger? <laughs> it's a rite of passage.